Broken Economic Models for Humanity. In this talk, I cover some of the toxic items of game theory, economics, and magical thinking that are occurring currently in technology, mostly in America. And my name is Noah Gift. Let's go ahead and get started with the key topics. First up, we have surveillance capitalism, which is a term that was created by Shoshana Zuboff in her famous book about the topic. She says, a parasitic economic logic in which the production of goods and services is subordinated to a new global architecture of behavioral modification. So she goes on to talk about some of the examples of this. And really the originator is Google and then other big tech companies have copied, but it's a new economic order and it uses human experiences as the raw material. So blog posts, selfies, uh, you know, behavioral data, it also extracts, it predicts, and it sells data. Uh, the global architecture itself then starts to control production. It also concentrates wealth, knowledge, and power. So we're seeing that there's a large income inequality in America, uh, and that's partially in, in part with the surveillance capitalism model. We also have a threat to human nature like uh, industrial capitalism threatened nature previously, and this new power dominates society. And so it is a very big challenge for democracy through you know, misinformation, disinformation. It also aims for total certainty and control uh, and takes rights from the people like a coup, but from above. And this is a very terrifying aspect of surveillance capitalism that we'll get into in a little bit more detail. So some of the potential solutions could be that we have externality first capitalism instead, and this would be creating markets for social good. And this doesn't uh, lean into communism or socialism or any of those isms. It's more taking the market itself and tweaking it so that we can optimize for the best outcome for humans, not just for corporations. You can see some examples like carbon pricing could be baked into a service. So for example, if it takes three bottles of water to make you know 100 words in generative AI, that could be priced into the service as a tax. We could look at media platforms being taxed according to the neutral facts uh, as a percentage of the content. So if a uh, platform is producing 80% of their content that's uh, non-fact-based, maybe there's an 80% tax on the profits tax credits for repairable technology as well. So we see that much of the economy in the United States is geared towards destruction, re recreation. But if we have repairable technology, that's going to limit the amount of waste that we're producing. Also, addictive technology could be taxed at a different ratio. Or if there's an addictiveness ratio itself that we could determine, we could determine a tax based on that ratio. Also, corporate individual wealth tax, this could be a great way to deconcentrate the exponential uh, aspects of wealth in a digital age. Uh, the right to repair uh, could also destroy upgrade cycles. So, you know, making it a law that you must uh, build repairable electronic items like laptops or phones. And you could also tax the externality by the impact. So an example would be if short-term housing is a startup uh, that is creating revenue, then you could create a tax on uh, the homelessness that is actually created as a result of that, eventually potentially reaching an equilibrium where there is no homelessness because you've taxed that short-term housing at a high enough rate. Also, the tax credits could be for employee ownership percentage as well. I think this is an interesting way to think about using capitalism for good, which is you still encourage individual effort, you still encourage entrepreneurship, but you actually cap uh, the amount of the entrepreneurship value that goes to the owner only, and you make the employees a percentage owner. Now, if we look at game theory, uh, the tragedy of the commons scenario is a very common game theory strategy. And we see this with generative AI, that the incentives are wrong for generative AI. And part of it is that the internet is a commons. It's like a public park. Uh, and if the internet is no longer a public commons, what do we do? Well, uh, part of it is that the data collection without consent is part of the problem. Also data collected without attribution and also data collected without some kind of uh, profit sharing uh, partnership 
is going to destroy the commons because there's no incentive to continue to create great art, to create great writing, to create great source code. And it's a lot like a cattle rancher or a series of cattle ranchers that are given unlimited access to graze on a national park. Eventually there's no grass left because they're all uh, taking advantage of that natural resource. So ultimately the in scenario here from a game theory perspective is that there is gonna be no incentive to create art again. And who wants to live in that kind of world? We also see that privacy is power. In an excellent book by Carissa Valise talks about this particular aspect, that it's too late to prevent the data economy from developing in the first place, but it's not too late to reclaim our privacy. Our civil liberties are at stake. And I think it's a very important point that she makes. And she goes on to say several other points in her book, uh, Privacy is Power. One is that data itself is power. So we need to protect data because it's a source of power and we need to have different rules around this. In fact, uh, I would argue that we should have uh, deeper protections for uh, individuals and their data and that data belongs to the individual. Also, privacy is going to protect freedom. So the more privacy you have, the more freedom you're going to have in society. And that consent, the way it's done currently is often meaningless because it's so complex, right? There's thousands and thousands of pages of of different uh, terms of services. Uh, and so in fact, there is no real consent. It's actually uh, your data is being taken from you. And data collection itself, uh, she goes on to say, is something that harms society. So just the act itself of data collection. Finally, what can you do is you can take action, right? You can, you can go to uh, your local representatives and you can tell them that data collection is something that you want protection from and that the surveillance economy itself is something that you're concerned about. There's another corollary to this uh, that's related is that if, as Bruce Schneider says, that data itself is a toxic uh, element to security and that the more data you have, uh, the, the more scary it is for your organization, you can infer something called the law of large data breaches. And what this means is that eventually over a long enough time horizon, some subset of data stored online is breached. So what it means is that, for example, social security numbers, every single human in the United States has had their social security number breached. And you could say that that's a subset of the data stored online and it's been breached. And eventually, given enough time horizon, potentially all data that ever exists will be breached just because it's the nature of online data. We haven't broken that pattern yet. So what this means is that data potentially is something that you should think about more like nuclear waste versus a positive uh, you know, element to store. And finally, if we really wrap things up here about, you know, there's lots of utopianism and optimism about all the different things that we've done. But if we look at the data, right, from a data science perspective about what's happened in America, we see there's actually not a great story here from a numerical standpoint. We look at the uh, income inequality here of the low 50%, the 50 to 90, 90%, the 90 to 98%, you see that essentially very minimal growth from 1960 to 2018, but the top 1%, the top 0.1%, the top 0.01%, we've got exponential changes here. And so this cannot continue uh, or else we're gonna have a very warped society. And so it, when someone says we need to continue, keep doing innovation or continue to grow, et cetera, it, it, you know, you have to question from a critical thinking perspective, what do you mean? Do you mean you want even more income inequality and that's a good thing? Or do we want to change things up or optimize so that there's a better uh, distribution for most humans? And if we look at, in fact, another uh, data science uh, endpoint here, and we say that Americans themselves uh, are really suffering from this kind of business climate uh, and that Americans, according to the Commonwealth Fund analysis, uh, show that they have the shortest lives, they have the most unavoidable, they have the most avoidable deaths. So what is happening here? Why is it that we have this uh, problem in America? It could be that it's the business climate itself. And so to conclude, we need to optimize for humans. And this means that humans should come first, not technology. Uh, and if we look at some of the things that you hear from big tech companies or uh, different segments of venture capital, 
they talk about growth, growth, growth. But it, again, if we go back to looking at income inequality, why do we want to continue what we're doing? Shouldn't we be thinking about uh, stabilizing uh, or diminishing what's happening? And so if we look at rapid growth, it's an anti-pattern. We look at addiction to technology, it's an anti-pattern. We look at income inequality, it's an anti-pattern. Centralized systems are an anti-pattern. Monopoly, social platforms, big tech, any kind of centralized system that has all the control or communism, right? They're all systems where there's an authoritarian regime that controls everything. Also, the most important KPI is gonna be welfare of most humans, not a few humans. And some simple classifications that you hear a lot to distract like socialism, communism, capitalism, it's not really helpful versus humanism. What do we do to help humans? And there, there could be a combination of lots of different techniques. And if we look at continuously improving the human well-being, that's actually a much more important uh, standpoint than the GDP because as we see, the GDP could go up, but it's not equally distributed. The environment is also where humans live, and so we have to protect it from global warming, from toxic waste. And so these are the things that we really should be optimizing for when we think about technology is that more data, more AI. This isn't really the optimization or more GDP. It's more welfare for humans. And this is part of thinking differently about AI and also thinking in a radical way about AI in terms of how can I benefit uh, a new technology towards humans, not how can I benefit uh, the existing I infrastructure and continue to grow it when we know that there's a problem with that particular architecture.